you're gonna do so much talking. Yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be easy. I'm not doing it. Uh, hello and welcome to Disrupt Ed TV, where every little idea can make a big difference in your classroom or your school. Yep. And our guests today, Joe, very special guests, mm -hmm. are Kimberly Harrington, who is the Commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Education, mm -hmm. and Dr. Tracy Severns, who is the Director of Student Performance in the Mount Olive School District. That's right. Mm -hmm. I welcome. can't believe I got that right. Thank you welcome, for having welcome us. Welcome to the program. Yes. That was terrific. Uh, but we're zeroing in on a very specific topic that is of interest to me because it's a little counterintuitive and it requires some thought, and which, which is a great topic. Mm -hmm. Equity and opportunity in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, what I'll do is try to start it off by maybe misstating, mm -hmm. and then you just sort of correct me. If I have 30 kids in my classroom and I treat them all exactly the same way without any regard at all for where they're coming from or what their differences might be, mm -hmm. that is not equal treatment. That's not fair. That's not just. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Correct. Okay, great. Talk about that equity then. What does equity mean? It's not equality. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think for me, equity means that each and every child gets the, has the skills to make the choice to be whatever it is they want to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, from wherever they might be coming from, given whatever circumstances they might... Absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. Whether that means they're going to go directly into a career, whether they want to go into a career via a college pathway, whether they want to serve our country in the military, but that each mm -hmm. and every child has the skills they need to make that choice, that they aren't put in a place where they've been pigeonholed and have mm -hmm. only one set of skills but not another. And so uh, the the range of options is narrowed. For it is them. narrowed for them, and that's it. I mean, that would be in, unjust, and that's what we're trying Correct. to avoid here. And that, that I think that's such an important concept. Yes. And in the classroom, what does that turn into? What, what kind of behaviors? What do we have to do in a classroom to eliminate the biases and blind spots that would normally lead to that? Um, well, first we have to know what students come in with. Uh -huh. we, we have to know them um, by name and by need. I think okay. when we seek to really understand who children are and from where they come, then we can use um, data of all kinds. Remember we talked last time about right. the importance mm -hmm. of viewing data, data mm -hmm. not as standardized test scores solely, but as information, just as information that gives us the insight so that we can tailor our instruction to meet the needs of, of the students. The individual. Right. Well, that's key. And you, actually, before the program, uh, Tracy, you were relating an, uh, kind of an analogy yes. of uh, kids uh, looking over a fence at a ball game. Oh, yeah. you yes. Can tell that. yeah. So a lot of people are familiar, educators may be familiar, with kind of an iconic image of, of three children trying to look over a fence to watch, let's say, a ball game. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you have an, uh, a, a mentality that equal is fair, then all three children would be standing on the same size box, regardless of their height. So that might mean one can see over, one can just barely, and one can at all. Mm -hmm. An equity approach would say, depending on your height, you stand on the box you need to be able to see over the fence. Right. And so what that image changes to is the smaller student on the bigger box and, and, and so forth. And and I. An another idea that I heard, um, I was at a conference with Doug Fisher. He said, "And the, but the greatest equity is achieved when we tear down the fence. When you tear and, down the fence. And I really yeah. love that idea. That, and, mm -hmm. and so to know not just the kids, but the obstacles, and to systematically and systemically work to remove those obstacles so that every child is able to not just watch the game, but really get out there on the field. Yeah. And I think that's like what Kimberly's saying, where where it is open to every dream, every aspiration, every opportunity that exists. Mm, that's great. Now, the reason why you're both here is because this is something you discuss uh, between yourselves on a regular basis. Yes. I know that you used, to work, you used to work together at the New Jersey Department yes, of that's Education. that's right. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm guessing a lot of these ideas go back to that earlier collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, and I think they just go back to just some of the core of who we are as educators mm -hmm. and, and why we've connected and stayed in touch to, to really, um, as Tracy will often say, you know, we have two different vantage points, two right. different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And when we, when we put our minds together and we think through these issues, we can often get to a deeper level um, to tackle the problems because we, we um, bring sight right. to each other's sure. blind mm -hmm. spot. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's, that's critical. I and mean, you know, what we're really doing is, uh, what we're really talking about here is valuing the differences among students. I mean, really valuing their differences. Mm -hmm. Because trying to paper them over and pretend they don't exist is how we make our mistakes as teachers. Right. And, and then beyond that is, is, to, is to do something about it. We have to do more than just know mm -hmm. that our moral and ethical obligation is to act. 
Mm-hmm. And so when we when we talk about data and we talk about equity and its relationship to opportunity, mm-hmm. um, one of the things that, that, that I, I kind of like to think about is, is to view data as a barometer for social justice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because social justice to me says that you have the right, I'm going to say, you, you have the, you deserve to be able to be all that your potential should allow you to be. And I like to distinguish that even from the potential that sometimes we ascribe to kids. That's right. mm-hmm. True. Because in some places there's a deficit mentality. We talk about what they won't do, what they can't do, what mm-hmm. they don't do. Right. And then in other places they look for the possibilities. They look for the potential. They say, you know, I yes, he's he's currently struggling there or this is something he lacks and he has this gift and he has this skill or talent and mm-hmm. so the idea is to mitigate to, to to systematically bring down or or eliminate those obstacles while cultivating and really nurturing every possibility for the child to become the very very best version of themselves and they can possibly be learn how to recognize their their skills and their skill sets mm-hmm. yeah and i think adding to that when tracy talks about you know that data is the barometer so yeah. that's that gives us a reading right, right. of where sure. of where a child is and then it helps us know where they where they're going and are they getting there. Mm -hmm. But I think the other piece that's so critical to that is combining it with, for me, data tells the story. Mm -hmm. Data speaks, um, I know I talk all the time about student voice, and data is another way for that student Mm -hmm. voice to come off the paper and for us to hear and see because oftentimes um, when we look at data or we think about data, we think about it as numbers, as spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. And, And it is both of those things, but if we look deeply at it and we have fierce conversations around it, it tells the story. Mm-hmm. It tells the story of each individual child, mm-hmm. and it also tells that story of where they are on a continuum. Right. And it helps us to mm-hmm. mitigate those differences. It's just more than numbers. That's right. right. That's it important. is. It is really at its very heart. I see it as our truth. Mm-hmm. Okay. It, it speaks our truth. It is the reality of where we are succeeding Mm -hmm. and where we are struggling, and maybe even places where we're failing. Mm -hmm. And I think that it takes great courage Mm -hmm. to look to first to seek to know Mm -hmm. and to really understand where we are and the degree to which we are truly serving those different needs of students. Those in in different but more fair and more just ways. Right. Uh, We need to take a break. Mm -hmm. Uh, We'll be right back with uh, more of these great guests, Tracy Severns and Kimberly Harrington on Disrupted TV. Stick around. Uh, welcome back to Disrupt Ed TV. My name is, what was my name again? You're El Cine. And you're Joe Esamay. Right, there you go. What a pleasure <laughs> working with you. Yeah, my pleasure. But it's really great talking today with Dr. Tracy Severs mm-hmm. and Kimberly Harrington about equity and opportunity in schools. And during the break, <clears throat> I was relating an experience I recently had with a school principal mm-hmm. who was correlating adverse child experiences, a- adverse childhood experiences, mm-hmm. ACE, mm-hmm. which is data. Mm-hmm. And uh, that is a way of measuring how much trauma a child may have experienced before they came into your classroom, mm-hmm. which may explain some of the difficulties you're having in connecting with that child. Sure. Is that Re- right? Yeah, it's really important information to have. Uh, and again, you know, Tracy always says, she's the data queen, mm-hmm. and she always says <laughs> that, mm-hmm. you know, data is information. And, yeah. and it's so important to know because the research shows us that when children have gone through traumatic experiences, let alone multiple traumatic experiences, Mm -hmm. that there are literally inhibitors in the brain that don't allow them to access learning. Mm -hmm. And so when we have that information, it's powerful because Mm -hmm. it helps us to see the child for who they really are. And maybe something that we've prejudged or predetermined is is why they're not learning or why they're being disruptive. Mm -hmm. You know, we can really get to the root cause Mm -hmm. through that information to break down the barrier. You know, I'm thinking too, we're speaking to the role of uh, somebody in the classroom we don't normally talk very much about. We usually talk a lot about teachers, obviously, and it makes sense to do that, but there are teachers' aides. There are other people yes. helping in the classroom mm-hmm. who can 
equalize, I should say. I mean, in a way, kind of uh, provide the different height boxes for the different that's size right. kids. That's right. That's right. That's in a way, you can help the teacher do that. Sure. Yeah, it's a team effort. It's called, if you know, they it's know, collaborative. If they know, if they know objectively and not just what they feel is right. true, it's really the difference between belief and right. believing something and knowing something. Is right. that right? Yes, yeah. And, you know, I've always said that, you know, without data, it's just an opinion. Mm -hmm. Ask anybody what we should do to fix a school, to help a kid. They're, they're often very forthcoming with opinions. Mm -hmm. But opinions may also be your most important data. So we want to make sure that we also know what people believe and how that is influencing what they're suggesting that we do. That was so, uh, so we've got to round it out. We've got to know what people believe. Well, and that was a point you made, I think, before the program mm -hmm. when we were talking. Uh, if you believe that you can't reach these kids, right. then you can't reach these kids. That's right. You have to believe fundamentally in, the, in your ability as a teacher or as a teacher's aide to make a difference in that child's life. Right. That's right. And I think another really critical aspect, and you touched on it in your in your your opening question, is that who has access to the data mm -hmm. or to the information? So, you know, for many um, teachers at the classroom level serving their students, data is something that they feel is kept under lock and key by mm -hmm. the administration or mm -hmm. that they're given only certain portions mm -hmm. of data. And so they're not empowered to learn how to collect it, how to look at it, or even have access mm -hmm. to some of the important information that they know they need to best serve their children in a in their own individualized way. And so I think that's another really important thing that we need to talk about mm -hmm. is, is making sure that, um, you know, in order for our, our teachers to provide opportunities and the experiences and to understand their, their students, we need to help make sure that they have access to that mm -hmm. critical information as well as to know how to use and it. And the ability to use it too. Exactly. Right. And exactly. know how to use it. And, and you know, that, as you were talking, I was thinking how important that is. Most people, when they think of data, think of something that's kept in a computer somewhere right. in a closet down the hall, connected by wires. Right. We're not talking about that at all. We're no. talking about what we know about the learners that we're serving. Right. Mm -hmm. that's and, right. uh, and that knowledge is really what makes it possible for us to uh, equitably yes. allocate our time and our attention to the students in a way that makes them all the same, yes. all, all coming from the same starting they don't have equal access to the finish line, even though they may be starting at different points. Right, right, right. Okay, that's great. And so how does that relate to opportunity? Maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, I think that to Tracy's point that sometimes when you have those sort of preconceived notions or assumptions, there may be missing opportunities because you've determined that a particular child or group of children uh, not necessarily don't deserve it, but can't, can't, get there, can't do that work, can't have that experience, um, whatever it is. And so I think when we can begin to have those really fierce, hard conversations mm -hmm. to look at what are the needs of our children and then what are the opportunities for them to grow, to fill in the gaps, to continue um, mm -hmm. to fill in all those tools in the tool belt of mm -hmm. their skill set. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a, there's a real opportunity there to to be able to see um, what you may not have, or or maybe you have it, but it's not available um, to a particular group of children or to all children, mm -hmm. and and is that the is that the the most equitable way to be educated? Okay, let's see now. Now, from the point of view of somebody who might be watching the program, who's been teaching for a while mm -hmm. and who has a way of approaching the way they teach, mm -hmm. uh, you're suggesting a change in orientation, mm -hmm. and they need to have some faith that that change in orientation is going to produce a different outcome for them. Yeah. Yeah. What can you tell us from your experience, maybe in the classroom, when you when you shift from a biased way of approaching students to a knowledge based way, which mm -hmm. is what I think you're talking about here? What kind of change do you get? Well, I think that it's it really is is immense. I mean, I've I've found found that when people operate from a place of knowing, what we mm -hmm. when we have access to the information, mm -hmm. and then we work collaboratively with our colleagues to really delve into like how are we doing how do we know what could we do better or differently to further accelerate this student's particular trajectory toward mm -hmm. opportunity and success mm -hmm. that really amazing things can happen I, I I really believe that we have not tapped um, our truest potential both of our students and our educators you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the idea that when John Hattie, who's done extensive research on the impact, the effect sizes associated with all kinds of factors that influence student achievement, the new number one factor 
um, and this is based on a meta-analysis of, of, of over billion students, is teachers' collective efficacy has the greatest influence on student outcomes than any other single factor. So, so what does that mean? Teachers, collect, well, efficacy is the belief that we have the power to achieve an intended outcome. Okay. Self-efficacy then, what I believe about myself, influences the choices that I make, the effort that I put in forth, mm -hmm. and the persistence. Right. When you take teachers as a part of a professional learning community, a di just, just a partner, um, when, when we work together in the relentless pursuit of learning, mm -hmm. where we use the information that we have, and an unwavering belief in the ability of students to get to that place, right. then, then I really don't think we have any idea of what we can achieve. I, I really believe We're, that, you know, I have been in schools all over this state, mm -hmm. and, and I haven't mm -hmm. been in one yet where I feel the pedal is all the way to the floor that we're using all of the research-based strategies that Hattie and Marzano has said work, where we believe in the efficacy of children to achieve all that they are truly able to, to achieve. I, I just, and so I'm hopeful. And if it's out there, if you're in one of those schools right now, <laughs> Call me because I want to come. Exactly. I, I, I want to see it. it. You know, so I've been in places where there's pockets of success, as you have. The leadership's great, and the teachers are coming along, or the teachers are great, but the leadership's new, or the community. You know, there's there just always seems to be something mm -hmm. or some place where it's just not turned all the way up. Oh. And I think my great faith in us as educators, and in this important work that we do. Is that we can go there, can die on that um, and what's what's critical are really two things: mm -hmm. our belief in ourselves and our students and each other to go there, and the data that will speak the truth, right. that will say to us whether indeed we are we are reaching the place where we seek to go. That, that that's a great place to break. We have mm -hmm. we have to take a break. When we come back, we'll we'll talk specifically about advice for teachers and school administrators mm -hmm. on how to make all this work in their schools. Mm -hmm. right. uh, we'll be right back with more Disrupt Ed TV after this break. Stick around. Thank you. Uh, welcome back to Disrupt Ed TV. My name is Al Sini. I'm still Joe Osman. As okay. always, and it's a pleasure to be here with uh, Dr. Tracy Great. Sevens okay. and Kimberly Harrington. Okay. Kimberly Harrington is the Commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Education. Great. Tracy is the super, the uh, I want to say Director of Student Performance yes. at Mount Olive School, mm -hmm. yes. school District. Mm -hmm. nice um, mm -hmm. So we're talking about student performance and we're talking about establishing standards for schools that it, encourage student performance and we're doing that by promoting the idea of equity in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one of the points that you made, Kimberly, while we were on break, on the break, was that uh, in order for teachers to make the shift from teaching in a traditional way to teaching based on what they know about their students and making it a different experience for everybody, they have to feel safe and they have to feel supported by their administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, we can talk in more detail or, or tag team this mm -hmm. one, but I feel like it's really, um, it's a tr it's a trickle down, it's a ripple effect, mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. will. So yeah, we've right. been asking for years, we've been asking teachers to give that safe space to their children to mm -hmm. learn and grow um, and to take risks as learners. Um, but I feel like often our teachers might feel like they're not in that same space. And, mm -hmm. and, and coming from the department level, I think we really need to be mindful and have tried to really shift our practice over the last year or two to be mindful that we at the department need to give that space to administrators. Mm -hmm. So if we're asking, you know, people to take risks and to create a safe space, um, really figuring out what does that look like? How do we give it to administrators so that they can then in turn give it to their teachers? Mm -hmm. And then what are those supports? So what are the supports that help them to feel like they're able to, you know, dig into data or to walk through data? And at the department, you know, we do a lot of um, technical assistance. We give mm -hmm. a lot of um, professional learning support. But I find that that really comes best, and maybe Tracy can speak mm -hmm. to this more, mm -hmm. but it really comes best from an educator to an educator. And, and although I'm a lifetime educator, yeah. I work for the Department of Education. Right, sure. And we just, the capacity to really make that personalized and, and to really take effect, I think is 
much better um, done from the from the ground up. And and mm -hmm. I know, I know that's really something that you're so passionate about and do such an amazing job of. Well, and and really, it's been made more and more possible by the work that the department's been doing in putting data in teachers and leaders' hands sooner in a format that you can really use. And so as the park assessments have evolved and the, and the information comes out, I think it becomes a combined effort to, to put the data in the hands of the people who can actualize it, who can turn it into something meaningful in their own instructional planning, in the conversations they have with colleagues, mm -hmm. um, to inform every level and every area um, of their work. And so mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think that really the, the partnership exists when the State Department creates an expectation, provides information, and um, the supports, which has been taking place, and then elevating the capacity of the leaders so that the leaders can do that work with teachers. And, and I think what teachers really need, I'm sure what, what you hear often as I, and as I do, is they have great intention, they um, are completely committed, and what they need from leaders is time, Right. Mm -hmm. They need mm -hmm. they need the time. They need information in a format that they can use. So mm -hmm. if you say to, for example, I, when I was the principal, I had about 400 students in each grade level. If I gave them the eighth grade printout and said, go find your kids and then do the data, that's that's really not fair. That mm -hmm. that's not the that's not where we <clears throat> need or want them spending their time. Mm -hmm. My role is to give you information <clears throat> on your kids help you um, know how to approach it, the questions to ask of it, to, you know, the way to take a look at it, um, and, then, and then the way to act upon it. And so it's, it, but if schools are, are always on that treadmill and it's the slant is all the way up and it's on nine, right. and the leader mm -hmm. doesn't find the opportunity to push the pause button, then we real, it's not really fair to ask teachers to, to act on that information. Right. I think. And I think it ties in, I think about, you know, again, what we ask of our students, we need to give to our, our, our educators, whether mm -hmm. they be teachers or leaders, um, that experiential learning. Mm -hmm. So when, if we're gonna support them, you know, giving them those opportunities, like Tracy just referenced, where they have that, that data, that information that's useful, but it's, it's in a scenario that is relatable. Mm -hmm. That's something that's tangible for them, that they feel like they can take it back and they can do something in their classroom differently right away. And and I think that's what gives us that energy and that spark, or I know at least it does for me, mm -hmm. is when I have that opportunity where it, it creates an aha moment of, oh, I see how this works now, and you know what, in this circumstance, I know exactly how I'm gonna use this. So I think, you know, sometimes when we support our, our teachers and our leaders, we do it as a cookie cutter, where everybody sure. gets the same mm -hmm. training, and it's not relevant to some of the people, and mm -hmm. so then therefore that, that learning is then owned and isn't transferred. So I mm -hmm. think really tailoring that support to make sure it meets the audience so that it's tangible and practical for them to use it right away. Yeah, the data can only be used effectively if it's in a format they can use and identify with. It's got to right. be something. Right. It almost right. has to be anecdotal yeah. in a way. Yeah. I mean, it's data, mm -hmm. which means it's measured and, 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 and objective, mm -hmm. but it's a story because right. stories are what people resonate with. Just right. So if you have to let the data tell a story in order for it to make a change. Mm -hmm. And uh, how much more work does a teacher have to do to make this happen? Well, I think it's bringing a level of curiosity to mm. what you find. Always mm. asking the question, you know, hmm, like, what do I see? What do I notice? What can I do with this information? And, and, and really engaging in a conversation. So I think it doesn't have to be viewed as layers of additional work. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of, um, it, it's engaging in, a, in an ongoing inquiry process. Mm -hmm. It's asking ourselves, you know, consistently, you know, who knows what to what degree? You know, where are the students and where do I need to go next? And, um, you know, one of the things that we've talked about is even in the past is, is simple ways to gather classroom data. If you just walk right. around mm -hmm. with a clipboard with your students' names down the, 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 the left column mm -hmm. and your, your intentions, your learning intentions across the top, you can walk around and be very intentional about noticing mm -hmm who's demonstrating mastery. So we know, we talk often about how the best teaching is done between the desks. Right. Mm. Certainly not from the front of the room, oh, like the right. stage, right? So because you've got to hear what they're saying, you've got to see. I mean, one of the things you'll see in all the pictures of Kimberly when she's visited schools is her crouched down, leaning, looking, listening, and looking at what the students are doing. 
that's the vantage point from which teachers can best support their students. So we make the learning possible and we walk among. Yeah. And we're deliberate about gathering the data. See, that's mm -hmm. classroom data that can be used to inform my planning for tomorrow. And when yeah. we add to that, that student voice that Kimberly has been such an advocate of mm -hmm. is, let's say, at the end of the lesson, you know, drop your name in the bucket. Do you feel you got it and you could teach it to somebody? You're starting to get it, but you're a little weak. Or I'm still a little lost. Or, oh, no, the flags are flying. Right. So, so when kids reflect on the degree to which they believe they've mastered their learning and drop their own name, like mm -hmm. on a right. post-it in a bucket, mm -hmm. the teacher uses that also to inform planning for the next day and create function, um, flexible groups. So now here's where you are. But it's a, it's a matter of just operating from a place of knowing, using what's right in front of us every day. Well, and that so, allows you to individualize. Well, and that, back to the bringing it full circle. Yeah. That is, well, actually, I think that's very important because that having that list of all the students in the class means you're not going to spend an unfair amount of time with just a few of them because you happen to like them or because right. they happen to... Uh, I mean, you really want to make sure that you're not leaving any child behind right. Right. by working with every child to make sure that they're getting what they need. And I think, that's, I, I think that probably is uh, the best advice of, of all to a teacher, and that is to look at the whole classroom mm -hmm. as individual cases and get to know everybody. Sure. And I think... Uh, I think that's great. It's been it's been great having you both on Disrupted TV. We're Thank you. we're coming up on that part of our program. Where we get to tell everybody how to how to reach you. So there's your camera. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, <laughs> how to reach Tracy? You. You're on. Yeah. Um, okay. So you can reach me by contacting me in uh, the Mount Olive School District, um, which you could just Google the Mount Olive School District and Tracy Severance. Or I do have an educational consulting company, and you could. Reach me through teach4results.com. Teach4, four, the number four. Teach, the number on the, four, yeah. results.com. That's terrific. Great. Kimberly? Kimberly? And you can reach me at my work, my personal work email, which is Kimberly.Harrington at uh, doe.state.nj.us. That's K I M B E R L E Y dot H A R R I N G T O N. And uh, you can also find me on Twitter where I'm, I'm hidden because I'm on there as at a gratitude girl celebrating the outstanding work of educators. And I want to thank all the educators watching us today for the hard work that you do every day to serve your children. Yeah, you're here. We, uh, we, you know, we, we, we couldn't be more grateful uh, because uh, it really ultimately we hope that some of the ideas that, that you heard today from Tracy and from Kimberly could be ideas you could put to work in your classroom or in your school, I mean, there were certainly a lot of suggestions. And I think the most important helpful. thing is every every school and every teacher can do those things. Yeah, they can, that's they, right. can they can take your advice and, and your uh, and your information and, and, and incorporate and make, it right in their in their in their in their practice and make it teaching a better experience and for make everybody. It, uh, starting tomorrow, I mean, right. starting or reach right out away. to either one of us yes. and we'd be happy to connect them to Absolutely. the help and the supports Absolutely. they need to better to do this work. You've been wonderful guests. We'd love to have you. Terrific. Thank, thank you thank so you. much, Kimberly thank Harrington you. and Tracy Severance. It's a real uh, treat. And, thank you. Uh, thank all of you for joining us today on Disrupt Ed TV. Uh, my name is Al Sini. Joe Asimendi. And uh, we'll be back again for another episode. We hope to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. That was great. Right. We get to use workshops.